we're not only working with antibody phage display, also with anti-gene phage display. What we are doing is we use complete genomes of pathogens, scramble them, package them into phage so that the corresponding um, oligopeptide um, will be presented on the phage surface. And then with the sera or other antibodies from patients or hyperimmunized animals, we can finally select oligopeptides which are immunogenic. We identify them by ELISA. And finally, we identified new biomarkers. So this procedure will give you now two um, examples. The advantage of our um, patient state based approach is that we can identify biomarkers or also immunogenic uh, oligopeptides. Oh, I think everybody can understand, yeah, right? For the video recording. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Okay, thank you, Carlos. So, the advantage is that we can also identify proteins which will be only produced in host pathogen interaction, that we can also identify low expressed proteins. The disadvantages could be we have the um, oligopeptides we identify. We need to express them or and display them on a phage, it must be possible. And we cannot display full proteins, only fragments. But this should be enough. The first example I will give you is my, uh, mycoplasm. So mycoplasm are bacteria with the smallest genome. Um, very interesting, they're using the opal stop codon to encode tryptophan, so you cannot directly copy complete genes to E. coli for expression. Um, it's, important, it's an important veterinary disease, so it cause, um, causes um, pleuropneumonia, and this is mainly important in African countries, like Kenya, where you um, have a lot of cattle. So what have we done here? So we make genomic libraries of mycoplasm, identified immunogenic proteins, so we identified 20 new immunogenic proteins, and we focused on four of them. And these four of them were further validated. These are the four oligopeptides. They were further validated with rabbit sera, um, where rabbits were immunized with different um, mycoplasm species. So we can validate that these biomarkers are relevant for mycoplasm. So we finally, we identified a biomarker. Then we made first ELISAs with it. In red, you can see a commercial ELISA. Here you have um, cellula from unaffected animals. Here you have cellula from infected animals. And what you can see is that our three new biomarkers, or in this case only three biomarkers, are very, uh, have a very good um, specificity in a positive and negative manner. And this is compared to the commercial ELISA. So we can develop a diagnostic assay. The second example I would like is Salmonella tumorium. You all know Salmonella because I think some of you had some infection with Salmonella and diarrhea. And here we also identified seven immunogenic proteins. Finally, we were able to produce the full um, size um, proteins in E. coli, but only of five of the um, seven proteins. And what you can see here is we validated the immunogenic character of these biomarkers. Here, you, here we have positive sera, negative sera, and the immune sera used for the selection procedure, piglet sera, which is, be, is, which is assumed to be negative, and the control of the system. And here we can, we have to compare the green bar, the green dots with the red dots, and we were able to verify the immunogenic character. Because we have also a complete antibody generation pipeline, we directly generated a panel of um, human antibodies against the salmonella target. 
for, um, for also, um, diagnostic purposes. So, I mentioned our antibody generation pipeline we set up in the last year. Here we have a complete pipeline starting with human material ending up with human tailored antibodies for different purposes. We are getting the antibodies of our human antibody libraries. We are um, derived from 44 human donors. And our compl complete panning procedure is high throughput compatible in microtiter plates. So this is a typical ELISA after a panning. So, and when we produce antibodies, we are not working with the antibody phage and also not with the antibody fragments normally displayed on phage. We are going over to this SCF, SCFVFC format. It's an IgG-like format, so you have a factor function like ADCC or CDC in, um, in cellular assays. And what and you can use it like a normal IgG for diagnostic. And we can choose what kind of FC part we are using, so tailored to the end user requirements. In our complete pipeline, this is the library I described. Now we made, made a further library together with a pharma company partner. And we generated more than 2,000 antibodies against more than 300 different antigens in the last year. These are validated antibodies and unique antibodies. So we have a complete, finally complete vaccine pipeline. So we can start with pathogens, identify biomarkers, which can potentially used as active vaccines or for agnostics. And we have also this complete setup to generate human antibodies, which can be used also as passive vaccine and for diagnostics. This is now the vaccine. Now I will focus more on antibodies and the biodefense field. The first example I would like to give is Venezuelan equine encephalitis. And it's very an equine encephalitis. It belongs to the group of alpha viruses. These are RNA viruses. They have a size of 60 to 800 nanometers. And they are mainly infect horses, but can cause also human epidemics. These will be fever like um, symptoms, but can also end up in encephalitis. Um, and this um, disease is all this virus is category B in the biotourism or category B biotourism agent. Here we are not we're not making human antibodies. We are starting with macaques. Here we immunized macaques with inactivated Venezuelan equine encephalitis uh, virus particles, made an immune fact display library of it, made a panic on active Venezuelan equine encephalitis, and here we isolated one unique antibody. And this unique antibody, we can use it for diagnostics. What you can see here is an ELISA. Um, we can use this unit uh, antibody as detector antibody. As detector antibody, we can uh, identify Venezuelan equine encephalitis and Eastern equine encephalitis. Here we have a mixture of uh, capture antibodies. And we turn, when we turn around the ELISA, we can also bind chikungunya and semliki forest virus. So it's an antibody which can be used to identify a panel of different alpha viruses. So in Venezuelan equinetsal, we have a different kind of um, subtypes. And we can detect all kind of subtypes, including um, Trinidad, which is the most important subtypes in real life. You know. And it's very interesting. This antibody is able to neutralize the vaccine <coughs> strain, but it's not able to neutralize the Trinidad strain. This is the important uh, strain, the important wildlife strain. These are in vitro experiments. But when we go to mice, the situation looks different. In mice, with this antibody, we can, is, this antibody is protective against Trinidad strain, the white side strain, and also TC83, the vaccine strain. 
this means also antibodies which are n not neutralizing could be protective because the effect here could be that they opsonizate, obs no. um, binds to the virus particle particles, then they will be taken up by macrophage. So, the last example I would like to give you is botulinum toxins. In botulinum toxins, um, we have different kind of um, different kind of uh, toxins, um, most relevant is A, B, and E. Here, number H was uh, um, recently identified, this was last year. And borderline toxin A is known to be the most toxic substance, and it's a category A agent. As a bio-warfare agent, it has a long tradition. The Japanese used it in China um, during the Second World War or before the Second World War. The US and the Soviet Army stock stockpiled botulinum toxin. The US destroyed them in 71-72. Okay. The Aum um, cold wanted to use botulinum toxin, but they were not, were not able to do it. Um, so they uh, used a sarin in the 90s for attack in the uh, subway in Tokyo. And also the Iraq produced botulinum toxin. So in nature, you have several cases of intoxications, but these are not so much uh, cases. Example given in France, it's about 20 cases per year. The mechanism of action of botulinum toxin is now we are the neuromuscular junction. As you know, here, the vesicles normally uh, fuse with the membrane and the neurotransmitters will be released. Here, very important are the snare proteins, and the botulinum toxin destroys the snare proteins, so the neurotransmitters cannot be released and the muscles kind of cannot be contracted anymore. The toxin is a dimer, it contains of a heavy and a light chain. One chain is for bi cell binding, the other chain is a catalytic domain. And what is normally done? You are doing a passive immunization with equine antitoxins, but this has uh, some side effects. There's also a Human product is called Baby Big. It's made from immunized human daughters. And we have a European community project. Um, and this project financed the development of a cocktail of neutralizing tumor like antibodies against botulinum toxin A, B, and E. This is the complete workflow of the uh, project. So we are starting with aminine immunization, making libraries, select antibodies, analyzes the in vivo, in vitro inhibition and, and ex vivo neutralization. The next step is we're doing a superhumanization or germline humanization of the antibodies and convert them to IgG and finally end up with in vitro protection. So I will give, I will focus now on borderline toxin A light chain. And um, here we immunize the macaque made a facial display library, selected a panel of antibodies which have a nanomolar affinity. Then we analyzed the in vitro inhibition. This is a SNAP25 assay, so you analyze the cleavage of a SNAP25. And here we have some antibodies with a very, um, um, very high neutralizing. And then we went over to an um, ex vivo neutralization assay. This is a phrenic nerve hem hemadiaphragma assay. So in the end, what you measure here is the muscle contraction. And if the muscle contraction goes down, this means um, the toxin is active. If the muscle contraction is going down very slowly, you see that you have an effect by your antibody. So we have a panel of antibodies with which are neutralizing ex vivo. 
in this essay. The next step um, was that we analyzed the antibodies in vivo. In the meantime, what I have not shown were the steps that we make a germline humanization and an IgG production. This was done with the IgGs. So, in this essay, um, is an in vivo paralysis experiment. We see here in blue, this is our anti-heavy chain antibody. In black, this is the anti-light chain antibody. Both have an effect compared to the control, but we have a strong synergistic effect when we use both antibodies in combination. We see the same when we, um, when we are doing lethal assays here with uh, five times minimal lethal doses. Um, focus on, um, on this row. You are, when using 25 microgram antibody per mice or 2.5 microgram antibody per mice, when you use both antibodies in combination, you have 100% protection. So, giving a complete overview about our antibody ABE project, this European project. We generated antibodies against all kinds of um, botulinum toxin. And finally, oops, no, finally, we are getting in vivo protection with um, both antibodies together. Or in case, case of botulinum toxin E light chain, the single antibody is enough. In this case, we need about 2.5 nanogram per mice to protect against 5 million lethal dose. So the project was successful and hopefully we can further develop this antibody as a cocktail. This was an overview about what we are doing in identification of um, biomarkers and how we apply antibodies for therapeutic uh, purposes. In the diagnostic field, we have a panel of different projects from Venezuelan equine encephalitis to C-reactive protein. In therapy, um, we had projects in the field of um, other um, clostridium acid, botulinum toxins, anthrax, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, also ricin, and, but also uh, cancer projects like breast cancer and um, Hodgkin lymphoma. We just licensed our breast cancer antibody to a pharmaceutical company. And this is the technology to identify immunogenic proteins, so to identify new biomarkers. We are using it, it now to clones disease, but we use it also for Campylobacter and with the University of Rhode Island, we identified immunogenic proteins of ticks. Give a large over, uh, short overview about the people involved here. These are only some of the people. Stefan Dubl is the head of the department, and all of these people were involved in the projects. What we also made, we founded a company which is offering um, service in the field of antibody generation, development of antibody and antibody engineering. Thank you. Yeah.